Lord Jesus Christ. He is awesome. He is always available. He knows exactly what he's doing. Whatever we need, we can find it in a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And I hope that whatever you're facing this morning, that you will look to God and that you will find your answers there. And that is a blessed place to do it. Hey, let's turn in our Bibles to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1 as we pick up on part 2 of this subject, a God-honoring prayer. And, and really, we've been looking at this book over the last few weeks. We've got a long way to go yet. And we've been looking at this, this overarching theme, this subject of a, the supremacy of Jesus Christ. And really, as we look into the book of Colossians, uh, we really see Jesus Christ magnified uh, there in that short little letter. We call them books. They're really more of letters. Uh, epistles, uh, they used to call them. And, and John, remember now, an epistle is not the wife of an apostle. That just means a letter, okay? And so when we talk about these books, we really letters. But Paul wrote a letter to this church there at Colossae because they were struggling with what is known as the Colossian heresies. There's a young church church. Epaphroditus is their pastor. He is a young Christian. He got saved under the ministry of the Apostle Paul and then he went back. He was such a burning fire in his heart that he had to lead his family and friends to faith in Christ. He did that, started this church that we know as the Church of Colossae and then he started struggling with this Colossian heresy where one group of people in time were trying to pull the Christians in one direction, the other group in another direction. So he goes back to Paul and says, help me out. Would you please address these situations for me? And said, so Paul wrote this letter that we call Colossians and then he brought it back to him. So then we looked at the beginning of Colossians and Paul was just basically saying hello and then he commended them there in verses 4 through 8 for some things that they were doing in their life. He had heard about their faith, heard about how God had uh, radically changed their lives. He was celebrating that, talked about their love there and then in verse 9 through 12 he begins to tell them about some of the prayers that he was praying for them. So that's where we find ourselves now. Colossians chapter 1 1, verse 9 through 12. Let's stand together all over the building. And there at home, when your Bible's opened up, as we honor and reverence the reading of God's perfect word. And I really want you to tune in today because we're really going to have some, some good stuff. I'm going to try to keep it short, Lewis. Don't say amen. But I'm going to try and keep it short. And then we got a really a, a lot going on next week. Rem reminder that we are baptizing two next Sunday. We're going to have a lot of guests here. Uh, some of them are unbelievers. And so we're really going to try to press in uh, next Sunday and help these people out. So Colossians chapter 1, verse 9 through 12, the Word of God says this. For this reason also, since the day we heard of it, we have not ceased to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so that you will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, to please him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, for the attaining of all steadfastness and patience joyously, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. Let's pray together. Our most gracious and eternal Father, we are so thankful that you have given us the glorious privilege to be called into your, your family, that through repentance of our sin and total faith and trust in Jesus Christ and Him alone, we can become a child of Almighty God. And we can call you our Father. And Lord, we thank you that as we've sung today, you are indeed a good, good Father. And that everything that we need can be found in a right relationship with you. And Lord, no matter what we're struggling with here today, we can look to you. And you're not hiding from anybody. So Father, I pray that each and every one of us here on campus, and there online, and those who will watch on YouTube later on, Lord, I pray that even now we begin to look to you. We will lay down any burdens at your feet. And Father, is anybody lost, I beg you in Jesus' name to save them, even now. Father, bring back every wandering Christian. And Father, I pray that you move in our hearts here today in a way that only you can. Father, would you speak? And would you help us to obey? For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. May be seated. Well, we began to look at Paul's prayer. He had mentioned uh, earlier 
that he was constantly giving thanks to them and praying for them. And then now he starts to describe in a little bit of detail what that prayer was. He had mentioned that not only was he praying for them, but his friends Timothy and others were praying as well. He also mentioned that Epaphroditus, their pastor, was praying for them. Then he challenged them, don't let us do all the work. You guys need to pray for yourself. And so we saw last week the request of God's enlightenment. And so he was praying specifically there in verse 9. He said, for this reason also, uh, the reason that he had heard about the, the good report, he said, because I heard this good report and things are going well, he says, because of that very reason, since the day we heard of it, heard of that good report, uh, that they got saved and they, they loved others. He said, we have not ceased to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will. Remember, one of the Colossian heresies that he's going to be struggling with and dealing with, that the, the, the believers there in Colossae are struggling with, is this, this group called the uh, Gnostics, from the Greek word gnosis, meaning they had this knowledge. And what they were trying to say is, we have superior knowledge than you guys do concerning God and spiritual matters. And what you need to do is you need to listen to us. But Paul will go on to describe that their knowledge is really a false knowledge. So his prayer for them is that they would have a true knowledge. There's a lot of false understandings about who Jesus is out in the world today. We got a lot of folks that call themselves Christians, and yet they have no clue who God is. We know that the Mormons call themselves the Church of Jesus Christ and Latter-day Saints. And they say, we worship the same God. The only problem is, their Jesus was a man who became a God. And the Bible clearly reveals that God, Jesus was a God who became a man. The exact opposite. The Jehovah's Witnesses say they got the right one, but the only problem is they see him as being just the son of God, but not God the son. And so we got to have the right kind of knowledge. When somebody says to you, I'm talking about Jesus, we need to ask them, what Jesus are you talking about? Because there's a lot of folks out there using our vocabulary, but not our dictionary. So when they say the same words, they mean something very different. And so Paul is challenging them there that you have this false knowledge from this group called the Gnostics and I need to confront them. I, I need to let you know that it is really the supremacy of Jesus Christ, that he is all that you need, and in him you are complete and full. And he'll talk about that in significant detail later on in his letter. And so he's praying that they will be filled with the knowledge of God. Remember that word filled with means controlled by. And so we say that somebody's angry all the time, they're controlled by their anger. Somebody worries all the time. They're controlled by their worry. And so what he's saying is, I want you to be filled with, I want you to be controlled by the knowledge of God's will. How do we discern God's will? We read our Bibles. And the will of God is laid out for us clearly in the Bible. And so what we need to do is go to the Bible and then say, God, illuminate truth from your word so I can tell how to live my life. And when I get outside your will, help me to get back inside your will. And so he tells us all of that there in his word. Well, let's move now, because last week we looked at the, the request for God's enlightenment. But now we're going to see in verse 10, why is Paul praying for them to have all this knowledge? And we notice the results of God's enlightenment. The results of God's enlightenment. There's three results. I can only get through half of the first one today. So notice the plan for the believer. When we really understand the knowledge of God's will, we will understand the plan that God has for our lives and then be able to carry out that plan in our lives. And again, it's all revealed in the Word of God. That's why we've got to read our Bibles every day. So two thoughts today. We'll pick up the rest of it next week. Is The first thing I notice is that God desires for us to live a proper life. He wants for us to live a proper life. That's why He's revealing His will to us. Look there at verse 10. He says, so that. Now remember, he prayed last week that they be filled with the knowledge of God's will, controlled by God's will. And now he tells us why. That phrase, so that, every time you see it in your Bible, it is a purpose clause. It is a very reason why what was just stated is being stated. So anytime you see the word so that, you've got to go back to what was just saying. And he's saying, I just said these things, and here's the reason why I said them. And so I just pray that you would be filled with the knowledge of God's will. And here's the reason why I want you to be filled with the knowledge of God's will. Now, it is not for information. It's for transformation. 
So the reason why we read our Bibles and discern God's will is not so we can say, well, that was really cool. I learned some good stuff today in my Bible study. No, it's so that our lives can be transformed. The very reason why John was teaching us in Sunday school this morning was to have lives transformed. The very reason why we're here this morning is not to learn a few things, but that we might leave here different than how we walked in. So that's why we're encouraging people, get your Bibles opened up, even there at home. I hope you got them opened up. Don't wander around the house. Pay attention. Now, the reason that Paul is praying for them to be filled with and controlled by the knowledge of God's will is so that they can live a life that would honor the Lord. He says in verse 10, so that you will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. His desire is that we would walk a, a proper life, an, an honorable life, a pure life. The goal of every Christian must be to apply to our daily lives what we learn in the Bible. And again, it is not just so that we can learn some things. It's so we can say, now that I know what God wants me to do, I want to obey it. And that's why Jesus repeatedly told the churches there in, in uh, Revelation 2 and 3, uh, He who has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. And it's not just, I heard it verbally, and I understand what you had to say. It is, I heard it with the intent of me obeying it. And that's why we pray, speak God and we will obey. And so Paul was always concerned about that for every church, not just the one at Colossae, but what about the church at Ephesus? Ephesians 4, 1, he says, Therefore I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the call of which you have been called. So Paul was praying, I want you folks over there in Ephesus, I want you to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. In other words, you've been called to be sons and daughters of the Most High God. Act like it. Act like it. I don't know how it was in your house, but my dad was always concerned about the family name. He did not want you to disgrace the family name. And our Heavenly Father is the same way. Do not disgrace my name. When we act one way that's contrary to what a Christian ought to act, then he says, you're disgracing my name. And so he says, I'm the prisoner of the Lord. And when you understand that you're a prisoner of Almighty God, you're not free to do whatever you want to do. You're a bondservant to Almighty God. That'll help you to stay clear in your calling. What about the church at Philippi? In Philippians 1.27, it says, Only conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Amen. And so we'll really try to magnify the gospel of Christ next week so we can help these people out in understanding uh, what's going on, why we're baptizing these people, because they embrace the gospel. What is the gospel? The gospel is that Jesus died for our sins. He didn't die for himself. He died because all of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So because we have sinned and violated all of God's commandments that we looked at in Sunday school, because we have done that, Jesus had to die for us. But then he was buried, and that is that he had to be buried to prove that he was dead. He was there for three days. And then he rose again, so we have hope not only in this life, but in the life to come. So if somebody says, what is the gospel message? It's found very clearly in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. It is that Jesus died, he was buried, and he rose again, according to the scriptures. And so what are we going to do when we baptize? We're going to give a symbolic demonstration of that very fact, that Jesus died when they're in the water, when they go under the water, Jesus was buried, then they came back up again, he was resurrected. That's why we always dunk them all the way under. And I was told to keep, keep Zach under there for a good long time. <laughs> and so Paul never challenged others to do what he hasn't already done himself. So Paul wasn't a hypocrite. He just said, hey, y'all do this, but I'm going to do what I want to do. No, whatever he challenged others to do, he, to the best of his ability, did himself. Now, he wasn't perfect, and he confessed that in Romans 7 and other places, but he did the best he could. So in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 10 through 12, he says, you are my witnesses, and so is God. And so it's one thing to say, well, you can examine my life, but then to be able to say, but God also could testify. Wow, that's a bold statement. And what he's saying is, even when there's nobody around, God sees me. 
So as you are witnesses, and so is God, how devoutly and uprightly and blamelessly we behave toward you believers. And so remember, the church of Thessalonica was a young church that, that Paul had led most of those people to faith in Christ, started the church there in Thessalonica. And then they had such a reputation that became a model church for others to follow all over Macedonia and Achaia. They were examining their lives and saying, let's do ministry like they're doing ministry. Because those folks have been radically changed over there. And so it says, you know, how we behave towards you believers, just as you know how we were exhorting and encouraging and imploring each one of you as a father would his own children. And that's a good way to behave, fathers. A father should exhort, he should encourage, and he should implore his children. Amen. Amen. And by the way, sometimes that means disciplining too. I don't know how it was in your house. In my house, we got a lot of discipline. And sometimes it was for things that I hadn't even done anything. And then if I said, I didn't do that, that was my brother. He said, well, you probably did something I didn't catch you for anyway. <laughs> and he was right. And I can tell you one thing. I never enjoyed the spanking at the moment, but I was grateful later on. And so he says that we were exhorting you as a father with his own children. A father would love his children. A father would do all he can to, to really encourage, but also challenge and exhort his children. So Paul, he would commend them and give them a good word of encouragement when they did good. But when the believers there were not doing good, he rebuked them as well. And that's what our Heavenly Father does for us. He talks about it in Hebrews chapter 12. If he's not disciplining you and you're living contrary to the will of God, he says, you got bigger problems. Your problem is you're not really a child of God. So in verse 12, he says, so that you would walk in a manner worthy of God. That's the same purpose clause. Why am I exhorting you like a father? Why am I challenging like a father? Why am I trying to be a fatherly spiritual figure to you? So that you would walk in a manner worthy of the God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. What a wonderful privilege it is to be called into God's own kingdom and glory. And we can never really get a hold of that. Remember that we have a very high calling on our lives because of the Lord Jesus Christ and the sacrifice he paid on our behalf. Somebody put it on Facebook yesterday that when, when you minimize the sin, you minimize the sacrifice. So we all say, well, we're all just human. Uh, God knows we mess up all the time. Uh, well, you know, it, it, people understand that you just do these things. They're just little mess ups. You hear somebody say, well, have you ever told a lie? Well, I've told a few fibs. No, no, the word is a lie. It's not a fib. It's not a half-truth. It's a lie. And Jesus does not like lying because he is the truth. He said that all lies come from the Father who is the devil. And so he says in verse, uh, Philippians chapter 3, verse 17 through 19, we looked at this in great detail in our study of Philippians. Brethren, join and follow my example. Wow, that's a bold statement to make. In other words, act like me. And observe those who walk according to the pattern that you have in us. So what he says, we're not the only ones living a Christian life. There are other folks out there doing it too. But what you ought to do is you ought to go find those individuals who are living for Christ. And then you ought to try to emulate them in your own personal life. And so when you, when you look and say, is somebody out there really living for God? That's the kind of person I want to model my life after. And then he says, verse 18, for many walk. What, what a sad statement. Not just a few, many. The idea is that most of the people that he looked around and saw them were not walking the same way that he was walking. For many walk, of whom I often told you, and now tell you even weeping. And so, so Paul was burdened about the people there. When they, when they didn't live right, it burdened Paul. Uh, it, it really broke his heart to look around and say, these people are not living right. We forgot to put it up there, Lewis. But there was a thing we put out on Facebook, and it showed the stats I've already given you many times. 93% of the time, there it is, 93% of the time, when a father comes to know the Lord and really does all he can to bring his family to faith in Christ, 90% of the time they'll follow him. Amen. But now look what the numbers drop way down significantly. When it's just the mother and the father's either out of the house 
or he's just off in the woods somewhere. He's on a lake. He's doing something else. Tells the wife, just take the kids to, to church by yourself. That, that's what happened in my house. My mother take us to a Catholic church. We were bored half to death. My father never went. Didn't take very long before we said, if dad don't have to go, why should I go? And then none of us went. And so we quickly found other things to do. We got involved in sports. We got involved in working and jobs and hanging out with our buddies. And we quit going to church. We got to a certain age. Says, I don't have to go. So only 17% of the time when the mother's doing the best she can to raise those kids in the fear and admonition of the Lord does the whole family really get on fire for God. But then look what happens if the mother says, I'm going to bail out too. If my husband's not going to go, I'm not going to go either. Why don't you get that church van to come pick up my kids and bring them down there? It drops way down to three and a half percent. Wow. That's why we got to challenge the men to step up and take on their responsibility. Amen. You know, we shared this on Facebook and we shared it to a few different groups. And, and the people, I'm, I'm burdened about this county. This county is in desperate need of Jesus Christ. And there was a lot of people who liked it. One guy says, thank you for posting this. God bless you for doing that. And a few others that commented. But there was a lot of negative comments. One lady said, this is just sexist Christian propaganda. Uh, a few guys said, well, I guess my kids are just going to have to go to hell then. And they don't even understand the blasphemy which was why they speak. And, and, and it's really, here's the reality. If a man fails in doing all he can to lead his family to faith in Christ, now look, there's only 7% that didn't, so it's not a guarantee just because you get on fire for God, the whole family's going to come. But the reality is, if you are really serving God, it is more likely the rest of the family will. Now, we're getting into a culture now where people are just so, uh, they really just don't want the men to have any authority in the house at all. They see it as being sexist. They see that he's just trying to be a boss. He's just trying to run your life. You women need to just kind of break away from that kind of mentality. Instead of saying, no, if I have a godly leader who loves me like the place loves the church, then who wouldn't want to follow that kind of leadership? But the numbers go way down. And so there were several out there who just made very derogatory remarks about that statement. And there it is. And that's why their kids are going to die and go to hell because they have not done their duty. And if they have failed in leading their family to faith in Christ, it doesn't matter what they succeed at, they have failed miserably in their most important responsibility. That's why Paul said, I'm, I'm looking around, I find a lot of folks not living right, and I'm weeping over them, and I am too. He said, verse 19, he tells us about the, the sad end of those kind of individuals who were not following the pattern that, that, that uh, Paul set for them. What was that pattern? Following the Lord Jesus Christ. And he says, now, the, there was many who I told you, even weeping, they are enemies of the cross of Christ. Wow. And when you make statements like those individuals did, what you're saying is you're an enemy of the cross of Christ. He says, verse 19, here's the sad reality of their end whose end is destruction, whose God is their appetite, and whose glory is their shame, who set their minds on earthly things. So what are they teaching them? A lot of them are trying to teach them about hunting, about fishing, about sports, about useless things that are never going to help them in eternity. What they ought to be doing is putting a primary focus on I've got to get my kids to walk with Christ. And then we can... Do all the other stuff. Teach them how to hunt. Teach them how to fish. Teach them how to change a flat tire. Teach them how to do all those things. But not if it comes to the cost of spending time teaching them about Jesus Christ. So even when I'm out there with Chloe working with these dogs, I'm still trying to teach her important biblical life lessons. Because you're always teaching something. Just no matter what you're going to teach them. So we should strive to live for Christ and honor Him in every area of our lives. And just as Paul did weeping and crying for these people because he realized that they're, they're on their way to hell. And he didn't take it lightly, as some of the people do. And they just think that we're trying to uh, scare them. One person made a statement of, well, well, that's a funny way to get people to come down to your church and give, us all you, give, give you all of our money. Uh, we don't need their money. We don't want their money. And God doesn't want their money. What we want is for them to get saved because we know where they're going to spend eternity. And, and the more we live in this culture, and the more the country goes further away from God, the more that statements like that and statements like this are going to offend people. 
because they really don't care about what God wants for their life. Because most of them are being taught nowadays that there is no God and your parents just made it up to scare you. So we ought to be trying to set an example for our families. What kind of an example are we setting? When our kids look at us, if somebody was to ask them, what is your father most known for? What would they say? I would pray that my daughters could say, Dad is most known for really loving God, taking church seriously, giving very generously, trying to witness. Not that he loves soccer and dog training. Those are all irrelevant if they don't know that first and foremost in my life is the Lord Jesus Christ. What about your family? What, what does your family know about you? Does everybody in your family know that you take Jesus very seriously? Do they know what convictions you stand on? Now again, they're not expecting us to be perfect. They know that we're not perfect. They don't expect us to be perfect. But they expect us to be real. And they want to see that Jesus is real in our life. Is it just something you do once in a while? Or is this really how you live Monday through Saturday? Or is it just going to church and putting on a show? What do our friends know about us? What do the people at work know about us? Does everybody at work know that you're a Christian and where you go to church? Have you invited them to come to church? All of my clients know that I'm a Christian. They all know I'm a pastor and where I pastor. Everybody on Facebook, they know it. They're constantly getting bombarded. I sent out several requests last night for people to come to church. So if you can't come here live on campus, join us on our live stream. So Paul was able to make the statement that I want you to imitate me as I'm imitating Christ. Wow. And he's praying for the believers there at Colossae. Remember now, he doesn't even know them. He's never met these believers. The only thing he knows about them is what Epaphroditus, their pastors, told him about them. So he doesn't personally know these people. But what he's saying is, I heard some good reports about how God changed your life. I heard how you have love, not just for a few folks, but for all the saints out there because the Holy Spirit is loving people through you. And because of all of that, I'm really praying that you're going to live a life to be meaningful. Well, not only does God want us to live a proper life, but we also see in verse 10, he wants us to live a pleasing life. God wants you and I to live a pleasing life. We'll try to get through this statement and then we'll wrap it up, Lewis. Look at verse 10. It says, So that you will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. And now here's why I want to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. What's going to happen if I do that? To please Him, to please God in all respects. So if I'm walking in a manner worthy of the Lord, I'll be pleasing God in every aspect of my life. So a proper life is a pleasing life. Now this phrase right here, to please Him in all respects, it carries the idea of meeting all of our Lord's wishes. It speaks about a submissive servant willing to do anything to please his master. Now it was used in somewhat of a derogatory way in Paul's day, but he rescues it. This phrase is only used here in the New Testament. And Paul used it in the kind of way to say, not that we're afraid of our master and he's beating us up and we're trying to please him, but out of our love for him because he is a good, good father and because we're grateful that he's a good, good father, we want to worship him. We want to come to him and say, Father, what do you need me to do? Not because we have to do it to get into heaven, not because we're trying to pay him back, not because we're afraid he's going to beat us up if we don't, but because we love him. And so this brings up an obvious question. How can we please our God? If I'm to live a life that pleases God, then I need to know what I have to do in my life to please Him. Well, I don't have time to give you every aspect of it and all the verses in the Bible talking about it, but let me give you a few of them. The first way that we can please God is through our faith. Listen to Hebrews 11.6. And without faith, it is impossible to please Him. Not that it is difficult, not that you'll find it harder, not that it would be best if you did it this way, but it is impossible to ever please God without the context of faith in our lives, and particularly faith in Him and His will. For he who comes to God must believe that He is, in other words, that there really is a God out there, 
and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. And so really, some people say to you, I'm an atheist. And then if you press them on it, they have to backslide from that statement and really acknowledge that at best they're an agnostic. An atheist, atheist, no God. What they're saying is there is no God. An agnostic says, I'm not really sure if there's a God or not. There could be, there maybe there isn't, I don't know. And so when you go to an atheist, say, is it possible that in the realm of all the knowledge throughout all of the universe, that it is possible that there is a God somewhere out there? And if they're being honest, they'll say, yes, because I don't know everything, so I'd have to say it's possible that there is a God out there. And now they have backslidden into an agnostic. They're saying, I'm not really sure if there is or not. But you have to believe that he is, that he exists, that he is God, and that he's a rewarder of those who seek him, those who come to him. Now we saw all throughout our study in Hebrews chapter 11, all the different ways that all the Old Testament saints displayed faith in God and how he was pleased by that. And he even made the statement that he was not ashamed to be called their God because of their faith. Wow, what a statement. I've got to ask myself the question, is Jesus ashamed to be called my God? Several times in Scripture we see Jesus rebuking those who didn't trust him. And then several times we see in Scripture where Jesus rewarded or praised those who did trust him. And oftentimes those who didn't trust him were the ones that should have been trusting in him. And the ones that did, they were not even Jews, they were Gentiles who didn't really know God, and yet they trusted in him. And sometimes we have to be like the man who cried out, Lord, I do believe, help my unbelief. You ever been there? God, I really believe, but I just need a little help to believe a little more. And so the question is, how great is your faith? Well, another way, how else are we going to please God? Through our sacrificial giving. We can please God by what we give to support His work. Listen to Paul's statement in Philippians chapter 4, verse 18. Remember, he is writing that letter while he's writing this letter in a Roman prison. And so, of course, he's not able to get out and work. He's needing some people to underwrite his ministry. He's there in, in, in Roman prison while he's writing the, to the church at Philippi. Same time he wrote this letter as well, in Ephesians and also uh, Philemon. And, and he's writing these letters, and, and he's telling them, thank you for your faithful support of my ministry. And listen to what he says in Philippians 4.18. But I received everything in full. And I have an abundance. Uh, I am amply supplied, having received from Epaphroditus what you have sent. Now listen to how he describes their love gift. So it wasn't just some check they sent him. Listen to how he describes it. A fragrant aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. Wow. He's using the language of the Old Testament. He's saying it's really, it's like when the Jews would put an offering on the altar and then God would look down upon the offering that they were burning up to him, a burnt offering, and then he looked down upon it and if it was a good offering, he was pleased with it. Now in Malachi, he wasn't so pleased, John. And he asked them to shut the doors because they were offering up defiled uh, and lame animals. But when, when we offer up something that is good to God, he is pleased with it. And what a wonderful truth to know that I can give and support God's work and I can know that it is an offering to Almighty God. It is an act of worship to God. And so I've got to ask myself the question, with what I put in the offering plate each week, whether I do it online, whether I throw a check in there, or however I do it, what is the Lord's say of that offering? Is it well-pleasing? Is it sacrificial? Do I give it joyfully? Or do I only give because I feel like, well, we got bills around here to pay. We've got to help pay the bills. Do I only give the very bare minimum because I just want to just say, well, I had something I could put in the offering plate? Or do I really say, God, I, I want to give above and beyond. I want to give very I want to give very sacrificially. And I want it to be a well-pleasing aroma. I mean, really, it boils down to, do you believe the Bible or don't you? If I'm so worried about my retirement, well, I've got to hold some back because retirement age is coming, and I really don't want to give too much of my money away because of retirement coming up. Well, what, what are you looking to do? Are you looking to just go on vacation all the time, buy a better house, buy a better car? Or am I really looking to invest in eternity? And Jesus says, what you ought to do is don't really invest your money on things down here because you're going to waste your money. 
And then the moths are going to destroy them. The rust is going to come in. The thieves are going to steal it. What you need to do is put it in heaven where he has a very safe vault and to put it all in there for you. And so I can honor the Lord by my giving. And I can please him and he can look down upon it and say, John, I'm pleased with what you put in there. And I've told you many times that 10% is training wheels. That should be the bare minimum we start off at. And eventually at some point we've got to take the training wheels off. And so Paul said, it's not just some check that you gave me to help me pay my bills. He said it was a sacrifice. It was well-pleasing to God. Wow. Well, another way is through our thoughts and our words. I can please God by what goes in my mind and what comes out of my mouth. Listen to this prayer from David in Psalm 19, verse 14. It's a great prayer to pray. Let the words of my mouth... In the meditation of my heart, be acceptable or pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Wow. What he's saying is, God, will I allow my mind to be filled with? And Paul described in Philippians 4, 8, what, what should be in our minds. And then he says, what goes in my mind, what I'm meditating upon, we think about meditation in a negative connotation because we think about Buddhists just sitting around humming and staring at nothing. But meditating just means to think deeply upon something. And so what am I thinking deeply upon? What do I really dwell on all day long? Uh, what, what really captivates my mind? When I'm not thinking about anything in particular and I'm daydreaming, where does my mind go? Does it go towards those things that please the Lord? Does it go to how I can make more money? Does it go to how I can worship? What is it going towards? He said, in, the, in the, the words of my mouth, how I talk to people, how I speak, how I act, even when I get angry, how do I respond? And then he says, my rock and my redeemer. Wow, what a statement. Now, what is a redeemer? When we talk about being redeemed, Redeem. We say somebody's been redeemed. What does that mean? It means they've been bought back, been bought with a price. It speaks about somebody buying a slave and delivering them. So they, they've paid the, the ransom for that slave, and now they've freed them. And so we were slaves to sin, and what Jesus did was he came in through his sacrifice on Calvary, and he paid our sin debt in full, and he redeemed us from the penalty that was ours to go to hell for all eternity. And so he redeemed it, and so he is our redeemer because he's the one that redeemed us. And so will you remember what Jesus Christ has done, the sacrifice that he paid, and where he brought you from? That helps you to say, God, I want to honor you even in my thoughts that nobody else sees and even in my words, how I speak to people. Even sometimes when they make me mad. And so I want to, I want to live a life that would please the Lord. Now like the Apostle Paul, I don't always do it and I wish I did more, but I got to pray and say, God, I messed up there. Would you please forgive me and get back on track again? But the more I meditate upon the truth that he is my redeemer and where he brought me from, the more likely I am to live a, a godly life. Two thoughts cannot occupy the same mind. So if I'm thinking negative thoughts, if I'm thinking angry thoughts, if I'm thinking worrying thoughts, lustful thoughts, then what I'm doing is I'm not filling my mind with those things that are pure. Right. So the more I meditate upon God's word, the more I meditate upon where he brought me from, the less I will meditate upon things that displease him. I'll give you one more and then we're, then we're done. How can I please the Lord? Because Paul's praying that we would be filled with and controlled by the knowledge of God's will. Then he says, don't just be filled with it. Let it consume your life so that you can live a life that will be pleasing to the Lord. He says, I want to please him in all respects. In other words, every aspect of our lives. So how else can I do it? It's by living a fully surrendered life. See, some folks just never go deeper. And they, they just they kind of get saved and they just hang out here on the surface. And what he's saying is, go a little deeper. Right. Romans 12, 1 is a good verse. Therefore, 
Uh, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, as they meditate upon all the wonderful truths that he outlined there in chapter 11, he says, therefore, takes you back to what he just said. The reason why I said all that stuff is here it is, because if you will, if you will think about the mercies of God, here's what you'll do. You're going to present your bodies a living and a holy sacrifice, acceptable or pleasing to God. And then he makes this statement, which is your spiritual service of worship. It's your reasonable act of worship. In other words, based on all that God has done for you, when you think about all of his mercies and how good he's been to you, then the only thing you could possibly do, the only, the only result of all of that, if you're really grateful, would be to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice to God. Now, somebody has made the statement that the problem with the living sacrifice is it keeps crawling off the altar. And so we live good one day, not so much the next day. Then we live, then we go back, and we go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. What we ought to do is say, God, every day I've got to present myself to you. And Lewis talked about that Wednesday night, about how we must die to ourselves, and he said, you've got to do it every day, daily. Because tomorrow I'm going to want to live for myself, and I've got to die to self so I can live for Christ. And so I got to ask myself the question, did I present myself to the Lord this morning? Am I, am I living in a holy sacrifice? Is it well pleasing to God? And do I see it as an act of worship? 2 Corinthians 5.15, he says, And he died, Christ died for all, so that though they who live might no longer live for themselves. See, there was a time in our life we used to live for ourselves. But what happened, Gene? Then we got saved. And now we're living for him who died and rose again on their behalf. So the more I think about Jesus dying and rising again, and I'm grateful for what he did in my life, then I no longer want to live for myself. I want to live for him. Not to get in, not to pay him back, but as an act of worship because I'm grateful for what he's done for me. See, some folks, they think you have to do all this stuff just because they got to pay him back. Or just because they're trying to get good enough to get in. And Paul is going to describe for us in great detail throughout this letter, you can never get in that way. You'll never get in on your own merit. Listen to what he said about Enoch in uh, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 5. By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he would not see death. He was the first person raptured out of here. And it says, and he was not found because God took him up. See, people look for him. And when you live a life that impacts those around you, even your enemies will be looking for you. But where is that guy? And we could just picture in our sanctified imagination them saying, where's that guy Enoch? Oh, which one is that? You know that guy was always preaching? You, you know that guy was always challenging us to live right? Who always rebuked us when we were not, not living right? He lived such a pure life. He used to drive us crazy with it. Where is that guy? We haven't seen him around here lately. Now, I, I don't know where he is. I haven't seen him either. Uh, I asked his friends. They didn't know where he was. I asked his wife. He doesn't know where he was. She doesn't know where he is. And so I said, God took him up. And they were looking for him, but they couldn't find him. Now listen to this. Here's his testimony before he left. For he obtained the witness that before his being taken up, he was pleasing to God. Wow. That's an incredible statement. When even your enemies would make the statement, this man is pleasing to God. Remember the movie Fireproof? When, when he asked Kirk Cameron, well, what do you think about what all the guy's saying? He says, I don't know if I believe what he believes or not, but one thing you got to say, he's the real deal. And they're out there saying the same thing. I don't know if I really believe all that stuff about Jesus. I don't know you need to go down to the church. I don't think you really need to talk about him all the time. I think it's okay to live a little bit more of a loose and immoral life. But that guy is certainly the real deal. They don't expect us to be perfect, but they do expect us to be real. Now remember now, Enoch was a great-grandfather of Noah, and he lived for God and had a test when he was pleasing to God in a time when nobody else was. And finally, God, God got so fed up about it, he said, enough is enough, I'm going to send a flood and destroy the earth. And, and can I tell you, they have, they have really taken the, the, the rainbow and misused it. But I will always stand for God's covenant with mankind that he sent the rainbow in the sky to show Noah, this is my promise, I would never again destroy the earth by a worldwide flood. And all these 
atheistic scientists are trying to say, well, here's how all these things happen. Here's what happened to the Grand Canyon. Just a little bit of water just over millions and millions of years finally got this big, huge canyon. I'll tell you how it happened on the day of the flood. When God tore up the earth, there was no water uh, coming down, no rain. He didn't even live near an ocean. They were surprised he wanted to build this great big huge ark about a football field and a half long. And then it said the water came up from underneath, came from all over the place, John. And that's why the world looks like it does today. And so he had the testimony that he was honoring God and they took him up. I got to ask myself the question, what kind of witness do I have? What, what's the testimony about me? When my time is up, and it will, it will finish up one day, will anybody miss me? What kind of an impact will I leave behind when I'm gone? Now, you'd expect your family and friends to say some nice things about you. What will others say? Well, they say, boy, we sure do miss that guy. They missed Enoch, even though they didn't really agree with him. They certainly didn't follow his advice, but they missed him, and they looked for him. Of course, nobody ever lived a more pleasing life than the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen to the statement that God made about him in Matthew 3.17. And behold, a voice out of heaven said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Wow. That statement was made at his baptism. He also made the same statement at the transfiguration. But God could have made that statement at any moment of Jesus' life. Because he always pleased the Father. And so at any moment, he could have made that statement. Well, Paul says that he's praying all these things. I mean, he wants us to live in a manner worthy of the Lord. And the reason why he wants us to do that is so that we'll please him, please God. Now, the goal of every Christian must be to please God. We cannot please God and society at the same time because they are diametrically opposed. And James said to those who are trying to be friends of the world, he said, you've made yourself an enemy of God. Jesus said, you cannot walk with me and then walk with the world at the same time. In fact, he made a statement, if all men think well of you, beware. It's because you're compromising. We don't need chameleon Christians. Just kind of blend in with whatever crowd they're around. We need folks that are real. Listen to what Paul said about trying to please God and man at the same time. Uh, John walked us through this wonderful letter a few months ago. Galatians 1.10 For am I now seeking the favor of men or God? He's asking the question. Because his opponents are saying to him, Paul, you're really just a people pleaser. That's what your problem is. You just want, you want fame. They called him a chauvinist back in his day. They, they said, you're really just all about you, Paul. You're in it for the money. They really accuse Paul of so many things. That's what really encourages me. When, when people make false statements about your ministry, you say, I'm in good company. They accuse Paul too. They accuse Jesus. I'm in good company. They couldn't get the stories right. And even the people that were, that were trying to reside over Jesus said, you guys can't get your stories right. And so they questioned Paul's integrity. And all throughout Galatians, he's trying to defend himself. So he says, am I now seeking the favor of men or God? They're saying, you're a people pleaser, Paul. But then he says, or am I striving to please men? And then he shows them that's a foolish statement to say that he's trying to be a people pleaser. He says, if I were still trying to please men... I would not be a bondservant of Christ Jesus. He says, your statement doesn't hold any water. It's a ridiculous statement to make that I'm trying to be a people pleaser. If I was pleasing the people, I wouldn't be suffering so much. But the reason why I'm suffering is because I'm taking a firm stance against all these things that you guys are promoting. So Paul was falsely accused by his critics of being a people pleaser. But he states emphatically that that was not the case. Now, he says, there was a time in my life when I was trying to be a people pleaser. He says, am I still trying to please men? Oh, I used to try to please men before I started trying to please God. And so the same thing is going to happen in your life. When you start saying, you know what? I don't think you ought to live that way. They say, who, should you, who are you to tell me that? There was a time in my life, John, where I never told anybody that they ought to go to church. There was a time in my life when I never told anybody they ought to get saved. And if they didn't uh, surrender to Jesus Christ, they're going to die and go to hell. There was a time in my life when I never told anybody to give a nickel to the Lord's work. There was a time in my life when I didn't tell people to read their Bibles every day. Why? Because I wasn't doing any of that stuff either. 
And so I was trying to please men until the day I got saved. Now I'm trying to please God. And so when you're trying to please God, some folks will be glad. There's some people that like Paul, but there's a lot of folks that didn't like him. Just like Jesus. There's a lot of folks that like Jesus. The majority of the world didn't like him, and it's still true today. That's why that statement was so offensive to those people there online, because they, they understood. You're not doing what it says here. You're making no difference in your family's life in the context of spirituality. And so Paul had to rebuke them. Now, keep in mind, we're still halfway through his prayer. We'll look at all the rest of it next week. But all of this goes back to verse 9, Paul's prayer. For this reason also, since the day we heard of it, I heard about the wonderful report you guys got saved, we have not ceased to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding. So we cannot please God uh, if we're not obeying his will. So he says, I want you to obey God's will, but you can't please God by obeying God's will if you don't know what his will says. So how can you please God if you don't know what he wants you to do? Now, I just gave you a few. I can't give you all of them, John. They won't listen long enough. We've got to go home and cook those steaks. And so I gave you a few of them. And we have to ask ourselves, am I doing those things? Am I doing those things? And then say, God, would you help me to read my Bible more? Because I really desire to know what your word says. And then the more I know what your word says, the more I can carry it out in my daily life. So next week, we're going to finish up Paul's prayer. And we're going to look at the wonderful statement he makes there in verse 12. Uh, about how we have been granted the inheritance of Christ. Wow. And so how do we gain that inheritance? We'll talk about it next week. And pray that God will bring people in here. Many of them don't believe as you and I believe. Some think they believe like you and I believe, but they don't. And others just boldly state it, that they're atheists. And we'll do what we can to help them out. And so the question is this morning, what kind of prayers are you praying? Dads, it really falls on our shoulders. That we would lead with intentionality our families closer to Christ. Now, we're not responsible for anybody else but ourselves. Uh, you cannot make anybody do anything. If they're only doing it to please you, they're doing it for the wrong reason. They've got to be doing it because they want to honor the Lord. Not because dad says we've got to go to church, dad says we've got to read our Bibles, dad says we've got to have a devotion time, but we do it because we love the Lord and we really want to spend time with him. And if our motivation is to please our father, then we have missed it completely. But we must set the tone in our homes. And so fathers... We can say that we have a good, good father. Can our family say, I have a good, good father? Let's all stand for prayer. Let us pray that God would help us to pray not only for ourselves, the prayer that Paul prayed for the Colossians, but also that we would pray that for others. I really deeply desire that everybody who hears my voice, not only in my family, but all of you and all those online right now, I deeply desire that you would be filled with and controlled by the knowledge of God's will so that we'll all live a life that pleases the Lord and that we would impact this world around us with the gospel message of Jesus Christ. Let's pray, then the altar is wide open. Father, we are so grateful that you have given us this wonderful privilege to come and learn about you. Father, we recognize there was a time in our life we had no desire to be in your house. There was a time in our life we had no idea who Paul or the Colossians were. There was a time in our life we had no desire to think about the things of God. And we thank you that by your mercy and by your grace, at whatever age that was, you turned our hearts towards you. And now you've placed this desire in us. And it's there only because of your great love and mercy, because you are a good, good father. And Father, we pray you help us to act upon what we learned today. As we mentioned, this is not for information, but for transformation. We want to leave lives that are changed radically by the power of the Holy Spirit and through the application of your word. So, Father, I don't know the spiritual condition of anybody here, but I pray that you would speak deep into the recesses of their hearts and minds, save every lost soul, help every wayward Christian to come back home, help anybody with a burden to lay it down at the foot of the cross. Whatever decisions happen here today, we're going to praise you for them. And Father, we pray for fathers who would help us to, to live out as a reality in our lives the truth of Proverbs 20, verse 7, that we would walk in integrity, that our children be blessed after us. 
And Father, we pray for grieving fathers today, uh, grieving sons who have lost a father, a daughter who has lost a father, or a father who has lost a child. Father, speak even to them. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.